Hello everybody, welcome to another episode, we're here for the Wrestling Connection podcast, thank you so much for tuning in this week, we hope you are all well and you are enjoying the sunshine, if there is sunshine in your life and if there's not, we hope to bring a little sunshine and some brightness into your life right here, right now, for the Wrestling Connection podcast. My name is Chris, my tag team partner here on the other line is Glenn. Glenn, how are you feeling this week, my dear, dear friend? Old! I feel old, Chris, because... Not only is the home that I live in up on the market, we're having people around to view it now. And, you know, oh, before man. we hit record, we were talking about how we've recently had the 10 year anniversary of the formation of boy band pop sensation One Direction. Yep. And that just makes me feel old that that was a thing 10 years ago. I still think that's new. Also, who was it in One Direction that pinned Kurt Angle? Oh, Liam Payne. Yeah, Liam. Yeah. What a good yeah, name, yeah, yeah. Liam. The pain. Here comes the pain indeed. <laughs> comes out to Brock Lesnar's song. <laughs> well, <laughs> here comes the pain. Giving you a of my way. Like, oh my god. Did you see that? Because he could do some good moves. He'd clearly done a bit of like a uh, Lucia Leedsbury uh, <laughs> rehearsing, you know? Of course I did. Yeah, I've got I've got a sister in the family who's obsessed with One Direction and which kind of makes yeah. me obsessed with One Direction. So I did see that at the time. And it was when he was in TNA, so he didn't really care as much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just remember him when he was done with it, like out of the ring. He was like, "Oh yeah, my daughter is a huge fan." You could tell that yeah. he was totally doing that for dad points. Yeah, but totally. good on him. He, like, I love Kurt Angle, and you can tell, um, like he he's passionate about what he does. But do you remember a few weeks back when we mentioned Wrestling with Shadows, the Bret Hart documentary? Mm. Um, and the thing I always think when I watch that is that God, you know, no one can take away your your passion or your talent, but you take it too seriously. And I don't think Kurt Angle takes it too seriously. Do you know what I mean? That's not to say I, that he, but uh, what, what I'm, that's not to mean that he doesn't take it seriously. What I mean is specifically that he doesn't take it too seriously. Yeah, I totally um, agree. So. He he obviously is a is a, a professional, and he he was clearly wanting to have a good ending to his career, you know, by pitching that match with Cena and stuff, and and still doing the job for Baron Corbin on the way yeah. out. Uh, but he's also quite happy to just be a great dad and to be pinned by Liam Payne from One Direction. Who is your favorite member of One Direction? Uh, who's the one who's the X Factor judge? Uh, Louis. Louis, I like him. Why? He's good. Just because he seems like a nice guy, <laughs> like um, I don't, I haven't. <laughs> yes, but here's the thing: like I do, like I've, I'm not like snobby about pop music or anything like that. Um, I like I've, I've definitely heard some of his a lot of their solo stuff because yep. like I have Radio One on in the kitchen quite a lot in the mornings, but um, I just couldn't name. Oh, that's the Louis Tomlinson song, or that's the Liam Payne song, or you know what I mean? Like I, I can, use. I can, yeah. Harry Styles, I AJ Styles. Oh my God, this is a thing. They're all wrestlers. <laughs> um, uh, so I, you know, I, I just say that because he's probably the one whose face I've seen the most over the last few years from seeing him on like right. Britain's Got the X Factor and possibly new soap star superstar on Ice. Okay, there you go. Well, there's a lot of description who's your, of <laughs> who's, mine? who's your favorite? My favorite. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be Harry. Harry's got to be my favorite. He's my he's my favorite voice of the of the group, and his solo stuff is is great. Yeah. Favourite One Direction song? Best song ever. Right. Uh, speaking of best song ever, do you know what this is? The Wrestling Connection podcast? Episode number X7. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Here we go. We've made it to 17, ladies and gents, at the Houston <laughs> Astrodome. 67,925 wow. fans here in attendance right now. 67,925 fans, very much. <laughs> very much. <laughs> and in this contest, there will be no, no. qualification. <laughs> <laughs> He's almost a wee bit sexy when he does that. <laughs> no. There's <laughs> qualification. Oh, we missed the fink dearly. We hope that oh, we can uh, we can find someone as loved and beloved and respected as the fink was in his life, you know? So, uh, mm. big big respect to Howard Finkel and his illustrious career. Uh, just scrolling through Instagram before we started recording there, and the WWE Network account have posted, create your dream Shawn Michaels match. So I decided, okay, we're going to do it on the podcast. So I'm going to pitch this to you, okay? Right. So... You've got uh, three categories to choose from and you have to like create this ultimate Shawn Michaels dream match. 
First right. category is pick your HBK, right? So you've either got rockers, Shawn Michaels. Mm-hmm. Then you've got heel, early 90s Shawn Michaels who turned on Marty Jannetty. Yeah. Then you've got DX Shawn Michaels from the late 90s. And then you have the resurgence Shawn Michaels from the mid-2000s. So you have to pick your HBK. Uh, that that's easy because m- my favorite, everyone's favorite, the best Shawn Michaels is the resurgence Shawn Michaels. Easy. Yeah, agreed. Uh, then pick his dream opponent. He gets six options here. You can either okay. have Shawn Michaels compete against AJ Styles, Johnny Gargano, Ooh. Seth Rollins, Adam Cole, baby, Big Drew, or Ricochet. Okay, so. I'm fat. There's a lot. They're all great athletes, all worthy. But yeah. I, I'm tr- I'm thinking of Mr. WrestleMania and star power. So for me, it comes down to Seth or AJ, and that's where I'm torn because you know the the match that the dream match that compelled everybody was the AJ Styles, yeah, uh, HBK, uh, and you know that was one that a lot of people were, and, and that would be excellent. But I'm probably going to go for Seth because I'm probably by. An inch, I'm probably more of a Seth fan than an AJ fan. Right. Not by much, though, as, as wrestlers. So I'm going to go Seth. I also think he's probably the bigger star. That's just the way it is, I think. Um, and so mm. I think that's the bigger marquee match. Um, but that's a difficult one. It's, it's very close. It's Seth or AJ. I mean, I'd, I'm I'd guessing you're going to say AJ. Yeah, I'd probably go AJ. Um, but it's just imagine Sean in like 08, 07 against AJ and not even earlier than actually Sean in like 04 mm. versus AJ in like 2016 or something can you imagine that match oh yeah, my god I mean god. AJ around that time when he was having the feuds with Cena I don't think there's been a, a better time in his career I don't think there's been a more oh, consistent no. and that's no, saying something prime. because the, the man is is amazing but you know people who want to flag ageism at wrestling really right. don't have any legs to stand on because AJ Styles and Shawn Michaels both hit their prime in their 40s. I would argue that Jericho was in his prime in his 40s, which a, a year, Agreed. a decade, which he's now leaving. He's, and he's he'll, he'll be 50 in the next year or two. Um, and I would say, if you look at the Undertaker. last 10 years of his life, oh, God, yeah, easily. Like, here's the thing about The Undertaker. Obviously, he's a legendary character and he was a consistent star, but I don't think he was like a Hall of Fame wrestler until he was yep. in his 40s. Agreed. And, I mean, you could put so many other people in their 40s up there. Randy Orton. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, John Cena would be another one. Rey Mysterio. Was Rey Mysterio in his 40s? I don't know. He must be by now. Yeah, maybe. Jeff I'm Hardy. Sure. He's just entering his 40s, isn't he? He's 40, what age is he, 42 or something? I don't know. He's, he's only just there, so I think the jury's out for him because he's, he's, I think he's had better runs than what he's having yeah, now. Yeah, I, I guess. You know, that, that, that could easily change, you know? Time yeah. will tell. Okay, uh, and then the last option on the Shawn Michaels dream match is choose an event. I think we're probably going to be unanimous here. It's either at Extreme Rules, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, or NXT TakeOver. Oh, Extreme Rules. <laughs> <laughs> the horror show. <laughs> Swamp match. Uh, no, eye for an eye, because Sean can already stand to lose one. Oh, and that's terrible. <laughs> I'm yes, so, so sorry. Michaels. I am so sorry. That's terrible. I'm embarrassed. Um, obviously, it's WrestleMania. I mean, especially whether it's AJ or Seth, that's a WrestleMania match. And the only exception would be if you were going to do the Royal Rumble at the um, at, in San Antonio, as was mm. rumored for like for the AJ Shawn Michaels match. That's right. Yeah. Remember when that graphic came out? Like, did you believe that that was going to happen, or did you just think it was no? It was I, I, stuck. As much as I wanted to happen, I just didn't believe it because it was it was obviously a fake for me. Because as good as it looked, one of them was wearing a baseball cap. I think it was Sean. Yeah. Uh, which, like, I know Sean wears hats. I think I've uh, I've been conscious of his hats one or so twice in my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> for context, folks, listen back to episode whatever. I think it was twelve or thirteen when I yeah, told the story about maybe. meeting. Told the, you know, unlucky it was meeting Sean yeah. Michaels. Chris, Chris met Sean Michaels as well. Go back to find that episode. Um, uh, Chris had a, a quite a charming experience. Mine uh, was horrifically embarrassing, but go go back and listen to the archives. We can say that now. Uh, for yeah, more yeah, yeah. That. 
That's Isn't that like nice? Conrad quote. I mean, it's hardly we're hardly a uh, Conrad level archives, are we? But I know, it's, uh, I know. it's nice to. This is it. It's like obviously we're just a wee podcast, but it's nice to look on your phone and to see that we've we've now got a, a tiny wee body of work. You know, we've got fourteen, yeah. well, seventeen episodes now, uh, yeah. including today. So that's that's something. You know, you look through it and um, you go, you know, oh, what did we talk about on this one? And blah blah blah. You know, you can kind of look for things now. You know, whereas before I could I could easily tell you which episode was what. You know, but now I need to think about it. You know. Yeah, which is a nice problem to have. But to go back to what what, what we Shawn Michaels' dream match, I so for me it's probably Shawn and Seth. I also think that's the one that would be more likely to happen, mm. just because Seth's a little bit younger. And I know that's right. some because Shawn's like in his fifties, but I don't know. I, I, but I'm sure Shawn would love to work with AJ if if he wanted to wrestle. I don't think he ever will again. But yeah, um, I reckon if um, if Shawn was to wrestle again, it would be against an NXT guy because he's so big you know and, and coaching and stuff so it's got to be adam cole or gargano that he would wrestle but mm. again in terms of what i'd like to see it'd be aj no doubt and and by the way anybody out there who is uh, thinking about maybe going back and listening to that sean michaels episode that we did when we met him he had two different responses to the things that we said to him his response to me was you know people were going nuts and his response to glenn was whoa so definitely go and check that out and uh, <laughs> see <laughs> see what you think I didn't flash in my show, I promise. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> hey, man. Uh, it's just his hat ends up falling off his head. Anyway, you have to go listen. You have to go listen. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Anyway, how are you doing? It's been a long week since we last spoke. How are you, how are you feeling now? It's been long, but um, I'm good. No, I'm good. I'm primed. I'm ready. I've been out with the dog uh, today. Oh, good. Um, and it's just, like I say, it's just been uh, all grown up adulting stuff that I've been doing and not, not a right lot of consuming wrestling. I did catch uh, WDB Day of Backlash to get a wee bit of behind the scenes on Lovely. Edge Norton. It's a wee 15 minute thing. You should check it out if you haven't seen it. Uh, so that was pretty cool to watch. And just because I like watching Edge, he seems like such a good guy. Did I tell yeah. you that I had a dream recently that Edge came to do, but came back to do a show for Inside the Ropes. I know he's already been, but they brought him back for another show. And uh, for whatever reason, I was now working at Inside the Ropes, and uh, I, I I was gonna like be at the show, and I was gonna be Edge's chaperone, and so I was gonna get to hang out with him all day. But then at nice. the last minute, Beth Phoenix um, had a tummy bug, so I had to look after Aww. his kids, and I didn't get to go to the show. <laughs> he had to look after his kids. <laughs> And I think it's because I've seen like the, the 24 and stuff of him playing with his wee girls. I'm like, <laughs> like I just remember that image. So that that's what happened yeah. in the dream. Like the Inside the Rope show happened and I had to look after Lyric and Ruby. <laughs> Lyric and Ruby. Yeah, I had the dream last night that uh, we were at my auntie's house and we phoned two taxis. One was going to take us home and the other one was going to go to, to my other family's house in Edinburgh. But I got in the wrong taxi. So I was trying to explain to the taxi driver, no, no, you need to take us back. This is going to Edinburgh. I don't live in Edinburgh. Take me back. Take me back. <laughs> and she's like, right, okay, fine, fine, fine. And just as we were pulling up to my street, forcible entry came on. And I was like, hang on, hang on. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I told her to go for a drive so I could listen to the CD. Oh, dreams. <laughs> oh, I love, I love uh, the cover of No Chance on forcible entry. No chance. <laughs> I don't know who done it. I think I was just Vince, but like, had, oh, do you know who it would have been? It would have been the stalker of uh, Undertaker's wife. I don't like that, Sarah. I don't like that one bit. <laughs> God, we've talked about that enough, but I love that angle and no one else does. So, mm. um, You want to know what I've been watching this week? No. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I okay, do. moving on. Uh, no, uh, right before we started recording, I was watching Hell in a Cell 2009, um, ah. which is the first Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. And it had three Hell in a Cell matches in the one show. Um, oh, is it like there was I a get, legacy one? I get what they were doing, you know, trying to make it, you know, get pay-per-view buys, have a gimmick pay-per-view. But my God, three in the one show. Not even three in the one year. Three on the one show. It was a bit much. Um, mm. But Taker and Punk opened the show. And then it's Orton versus Cena in the middle of the card. And the main event is Legacy versus DX. Um, mm. And they, they do quite well. Like the, the first one with Taker and Punk is a very standard Hell in a Cell. And then the second one is like there's a ref bump and it's kind of worked around that and there's more weapons involved. And then the tag team one is the legacy lock Triple H outside the cell. So like they try and do a different thing for each match, you know, to make it a little bit different. But yeah. still, it's overkill a little bit, you know. I, I actually don't like when there's one a year, but I don't like when there's two, you know, a year, one from each brand or whatever, but three in the one show, my God. 
it's overkill. So I don't like gimmick pay per views in general. I'm like, I, well, specifically, I don't like TLC. I don't like Hell in a Cell. I'm kind of okay with Money in the Bank being its own thing. Although I used yeah. to love that as being something at WrestleMania you looked forward to. Um, but I, you know, Hell in a Cell has we've we've spoken about this for sure. Hell in a Cell is not special anymore, and it's not something that excites me anymore. Um, the last one I was I was really intrigued by was. Um, well, I was supposed I was intrigued by Undertaker and Shane, and I actually did enjoy that one. Yeah, me but too. I think the last one I was really hyped for was Undertaker and Lesnar, just because uh, I loved their No Mercy 2002 cell match, and yeah. I was really into that feud they were having in 2015. I thought that was some of Undertaker's best, like most recent matches in the last five years, were his return matches with Lesnar. I enjoyed yeah, the SummerSlam I... one, you know, and I loved the Hell in a Cell. I forget that that feud happened all the time. Like I'm going, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, Lesnar Taker had a feud in 2015. Like they had the match at SummerSlam. Remember the, the finish of the SummerSlam one? Undertaker gives him the middle finger, and that's it. There's no explanation. Like, I thought maybe we were going to see, like, a heel Taker. I was like, what? But well, no. yeah, it was so weird because he kept kicking him in the crotch. I know. Like, <laughs> and that was it. Just because he's Undertaker, why not? And he gave him the middle finger, and that was the end of the match. It was like a, an excuse to kind of try and uh, get Lesnar to lose, I guess. Is it not like a quick finish or something? Like, a really screwy finish? I don't yeah, know, it's really that's, strange um, because um, basically uh lesnar is choking taker out i think that's right or, or, and taker taps but the original shot you can't see the referee doesn't see it so it doesn't call for the bell but the timekeeper sees it so decides to ring the bell even though the that's referee right, doesn't yeah. call for it and it's the only time that has ever happened and it, it was this everyone was really annoyed because I know there was this whole redemption thing for The Undertaker happening storyline-wise, but I would have much rather Taker just submitted and lost clean. I genuinely would have done, because he's The Undertaker. Yeah. He can come back from that. Um, I would I would much rather have a non-finish where they both take a ridiculous bump and are, I can't continue than that. It, I remember being so annoyed when that happened. But yeah. my passions, my anger about it was a testament to how invested in the storyline I was. And I think when people get upset and complain, about storylines they need to remember that it's a good re- good reason that they were that invested in the first place and case in point seth and and the fiend and the hell in a cell right not a good match not a good finish not something which i think is fondly remembered by any wrestling fan as something for their career but the reason we got so passionate about it is because we were so invested in the fiend and so intrigued by this match we really thought we were going to see the coronation of the fiend there and then and if they didn't we thought we were going to see a rollins heel turn he was going to do something ridiculously or, or convert like we, we thought we would see anything but what happened but the fact that we cared so much in the first place is still a good thing and to so respect to them for that the execution of the actual match was just a shame in my view yeah, and I think because of the the hate they put on that main event, and then that or, or, you know by default you hate that show now the fact that the main event was so bad, you know. But we all f- often forget that Sasha Banks and Becky Lynch had an amazing Hell in a Cell match earlier on the show, um, definitely true. one of the the better ones in the last five years anyway. Um, and the, the two of them are just beating the daylights of each other, and it's just it's like a story match as well. Definitely two of the best performers on the roster. Uh, but I, th- I think it's overlooked, and I think it's a real. You know, the Charlotte and Sasha one's really good, you know, in terms of the women's evolution, um, because it was the first Hell in a Cell with women involved, yeah, right? It was seminal, um, and it was a good match. It was a good match, but I th- I felt at the time it was a wee bit slow, and it was a wee bit like it was the main event. We already had seen a Hell in a Cell match earlier on the show and that sort of thing, but like it wasn't this amazing match. It was good, you know, but I've not really went back to watch it. Whereas this Becky and Sasha one was like a great in-ring Hell in a Cell match, you know? So, um, history being made all the time by the women's division, and we, uh, we're very, very lucky. Do you ever think about that sometimes? We're lucky that we're here to experience that. You know what I mean? Not yeah. just the women's evolution, but some really important things are going on, like the start of AEW and, you know, WWE going through the the, the uh, Fox deal and now in the pandemic and stuff. Like, it's just crazy that we're yeah. here to witness that, you know? It's a time in history, and, and you know, to go back to the women's division, I think for our generation, and I know I'm like eight years, seven, eight years your senior, but um, we've both lived through the contrast of how women were presented in wrestling to how they are presented now. And I say that not in a triumphant sense, because as good as the progress is, I still think there's a lot of work to do. Uh, I don't think you can really feel comfortable until, in my view, there is equal representation. So I feel like the women's roster should be the same size as the men's roster and there should be a mid-card women's title as well. Mm. Um, And 
but I still think it's really cool to see the progress that has been made in terms of gender yeah. equality. I think it's really cool that uh, the best thing, in my view, in WWE programming right now is everything coming out of the women's division or most things coming out of the women's division, I would say. Um, that's what I've been enjoying most. I mean, it's mainly the Sasha and Bailey stuff I enjoy, but, you know, I love Asuka. I've been enjoying, uh, like, all, of course, all the NXT stuff. And then over in AEW, I'm a huge fan of uh, Big Swole and I'm... Uh, I love Nyla Rose and uh, Brett we've, Baker. We've, yeah, it was table of words from my mouth. Sorry, uh, we've 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 written a lot of love letters to Brett Baker and her body of work uh, on this podcast as well. So you know, this is a great time for women's wrestling. But I'd love to think that even though we kind of point to the middle of the last decade as the kind of uh, launching path for the women's evolution, I'd still like to think we're still at the beginning of something special. Oh yeah. Because love to see it get bigger and the representation become fairer you know we've seen what happens when you give these athletes opportunities so why suppress them further you know these things take time and you know and think in wrestling things take time anyway but like building a whole division i mean that's essentially what they've mm-hmm. had to do you know build a whole division and not just build the actual product that you see but earn trust earn believability from people because believe it or not there's still some narrow-minded people out there that don't agree with it you know um, yeah. So we, what we're trying to do now, as a wrestling fan base and in part as part of the wrestling business, is we are trying to not just remove that opinion from people's minds, but not even have that opinion started in the first place. You know, and that's going Absolutely. to take a long time. You know, because people need to grow up and people need to, you know, be a fan as a as a kid and then grow up and realize things. And you know what I mean? Like it's going to take yeah. a long time where it's totally 50 50. But I just think we're in a great period now where this is the best it's ever been. It definitely the past five seven years. Um, yeah, it's never sure. been like this before so um, there's, there's still work to be done of course there is um, but I believe we'll get there and it's just um, I'm hoping that we're still around to see it happen um, I feel bad moving on from that to what I was going to talk about now I was going to talk about some New Japan um, and oh, New Japan <laughs> are notorious for not having a women's division because uh, they're <laughs> 10 years in the past um, but I was going to talk about New Japan um, basically I got this DVD the other day it's uh, just called the an introduction to New Japan Pro Wrestling, and it was just this. I don't know what company it was. I don't know if it was Wrestling Store or whatever, but like, um, because New Japan and Japanese wrestling isn't as prominent over here as, as in the states, and it's not very prominent in the states either. But at least it, it was it was on TV over there anyway. Um, yeah. it's totally unknown over here, really. So they released a couple of the Wrestle Kingdoms onto DVD, and they released this sort of comp of like eight or nine matches to this set of um, I think it's ten matches. An introduction to New Japan, and I was thinking that's such a good idea and that's such a good DVD to have as like a collection, you know, because it's a it's a compilation of matches that you don't get very much anymore, and, and certainly in terms of stuff that I haven't seen before, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's definitely something to have and, and watch through and stuff. So I picked it up recently. And I've been watching it over the past few days, and it's it's such it's it's really nice watching different wrestling, you know. Um, yeah, I, I go through phases with New Japan. I tend to watch a lot of New Japan right at the start of the year and a lot in the summertime. But uh, in like the sort of spring, you know, around WrestleMania time, I don't re- you know really go near it. After SummerSlam, don't really go near it. I don't know why. I just I just don't. I go through these weird phases. Um, so it's nice to kind of have that DVD there, just to kind of have and, and watch through certain matches and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I was watching it last night, and I was just thinking, I wonder, like, um, going back to when I was younger, what did I know about New Japan? What did I know about Japanese wrestling as a whole? And then I was thinking of Power Slam, like it was always in Power Slam, pictures of Tanahashi yep. and, and the legends that are over there and stuff. And then anytime I think of Power Slam, I think of you, um, because you know you were such a big reader and fan of Power Slam. And I was thinking, I wonder what Glenn thinks yeah. about Japanese wrestling in New Japan. Do you have any memories of watching it when you were younger or nowadays or what? Any, any I, memories uh... of New Japan? I, I never, ever, ever watched New Japan um, as a teenager. I probably would have done if I had, like, a a means of doing so. Um, but, you know, I didn't have, like, my own computer until I was, like, 17 or something. So, right. like, when I was in my kind of... So it's not as if I could try and play a streaming service. And I was always too scared to to use, like, LimeWire, you know, yeah, like, the dodgy, dodgy ones, yeah. Torrents and stuff is always too too much of a scaredy cat that you know somebody would descend from the ceiling with in, a, in, a, in SWAT gear, not not the shield, <laughs> but you know, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, but I did I did enjoy reading about it in Power Slam. I enjoyed like reading about Japanese wrestling in general, uh, and I would be really intrigued by some of the eccentricities of of um, of Japanese wrestling. I learned all about Tiger Mask in uh, yeah. Power Slam and, and the legend of that 
a character who like you know batman has been portrayed by multiple performers you know what i mean yeah um and th- i can say the same about mexican wrestling a lot of what i learned prior to the 619 dvd uh right, I learned yeah. from, from from power slam but with japanese wrestling uh you know you would read about things so weird things stick in my mind like uh there was a promotion i don't know if it still exists but there was a promotion in japan in the mid noughties called hustle and right. um pardon me it's the one it's one that mick foley after wrestlemania 20 or after backlash 2004 when he did that match with randy orton which i've still never watched uh he mental by the way can't wait for you to watch it i can't wait he said he was done at that point he said that's me properly like i'm finished i'm not i'm not going to do any more that's a good way to end things we all know how that went and uh, this japanese promotion made him an offer to come over to japan and wrestle a match in 2004 and he said nah i'm not gonna do it and then they said oh but we're gonna pay you a bajillion dollars and he was like okay i'm on the first plane so he went (laughs) and he did a match and the same promotion weirdly and i've never heard anyone tell the story about how this was allowed to happen but in december of 2003 i think it was when goldberg was still part of wwe still in the roster main event world champion all the time or here and there and feuding with triple h goldberg was allowed to go and do a show for this hustle promotion in Japan because they paid him big money. And I have no idea why he was allowed to do it because that just seemed to be unheard of at the time, but he did yeah. it. Um, so that, you know, it, it's so... But And then you would read about guys like A-Train who, you know, left WWE yes. and, and then made a, made, a, made a really successful living in Japan, you know, doing yeah. the, the wrestling shows. But I've never sat down to watch new japan and i think it's a shame really because you know i i know it's promotion that in terms of the quality of its product you know has a huge loyal fan base like a diehard fan base mm. uh um i can't abide people who think that if you don't watch new japan that you're not a wrestling fan you, you do come across that on certain yeah. uh, wrestling facebook community pages which it drives me nuts own, yeah one name um uh it's like I've, I've encountered it so much at like when i've been queuing inside the rope shows or an icw like <laughs> right. people who you start talking to and they get so snobby when you find that they they find out that you're just a wwe guy or an american wrestling guy um but yeah like uh, i am um, but i've always had respect for it the only time i've really kind of switched onto it and followed it was when the jericho omega stuff was happening which is a shame because that's two canadian guys who happen yeah. to be working in Japan. <laughs> so you're not even seeing the homegrown talent um so yeah i mean i'm intrigued by it i'd definitely go see a new japan show if it was in town and i had yeah, the money and 100%. I just bought a, bought a house but um yeah my I, it was something i was interested in but it was very much felt like this far away thing that yeah it, it wasn't worth investing in because i would never have access to it and here we are in 2020 and you know wrestling from all over the world is really easy to access so it's a never yep. said everything for me well they've got uh, new japan world which is their streaming service now so it's 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 much more accessible that's how i've been able to watch anyway as well as this dvd i actually cancelled my subscription at the start of the year and um, after wrestle kingdom as, as a sort of cost cutting measure i'm sure you're aware of them um yes yeah, so i uh, i, I cancelled my subscription at the start of the year but now after watching this dvd i'm kind of itching to kind of get back to it because summertime as i said there's like something uh, one of the times i always watch it and I, recently i told my story about being in gran canaria last year and watching the g1 climax tournament every day by the pool it's yeah, like such right. a such a great like memory to have, you know. So I always think of that time when I'm watching the Japan. But what fascinates me about it as well, not just the fact that it's this far away thing, I should say, which I totally agree with, but also because like over there, um, is the only place I think that in, in the wrestling world WWE isn't the main thing. You know what I mean? Like anywhere you go, yeah. you think of wrestling, you think of John Cena, and you think of The Rock and Undertaker and WWE. Yes, if you go over to Tokyo. Like, the number one promotion is New Japan. Like, Tanahashi is a god over there. Tanahashi and, and Tiger Mask, as you say, Okada and Naito, these people are, like, legendary over there. And mm. people will then go, oh, WWE are in town? All right, maybe I'll go. But the fact that the G1 have shows every day, it's always sold out. You know what I mean? It's just, I think that's really fascinating about it. Like, their first point of contact is their homegrown stars rather than the American stars that we know, you know? Um, yeah. I find it really interesting. The first time I ever watched New Japan, was on the Chris Benoit DVD, Hard Knocks. And uh, oh. I don't know if you had that DVD, but he there's a match on there, one of the extras. It's him versus Eddie Guerrero, but in their uh, Japan gimmicks. So it's like Black Pegasus versus Black Tiger or something. Pegasus King versus Black Tiger. And uh, Michael Cole yep. and Taz do alternate commentary. 
Uh, right. And it's it's really cool. They 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 comment over it and, and just do their usual SmackDown commentary, but to that match, you know, so that was the first time I ever watched Japanese wrestling. I think. So the the reason I brought this up, I just wanted to tell a quick story because I was, I was remembering it, thinking about it last night. Um, when I was watching the DVD. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I did uh, I, I, some acting work in my life and um, I always feel weird talking about it, I don't know why. Um, you're an I actor. Was, I, was, I was doing a show, right? So I, I was doing a show. Well, I did some acting where it's like me going, oh, I'd, I've done some teaching work in my life. I'm a teacher. <laughs> and, you're an actor. Work in schools. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an actor. So I was doing an acting uh, job in a school one day, right? Which is a meeting, it's like the best of both worlds, me and you. And uh, I was doing like a tour in schools doing a sort of wee small show about being safe and making the right choices and that sort of thing. And this was two 10-year-olds, I think, 10 or 11-year-olds at the time, I think. So we're sitting up for the show, we're getting the costumes on and stuff or whatever, right? And the teacher comes in and she goes, um, by the way, just let you know, today is a non-uniform day. So, you know, don't be alarmed when everybody comes in wearing clothes. <laughs> you should, that's what you should expect, Chris, in a public school. Oh, dear. <laughs> What sort of school was this? <laughs> Don't be alarmed if the if the wearing clothes if the children are wearing clothes. Oh dear, God! If they're wearing Dude, non-uniform uh, clothes, you need to be careful of how you speak. I I remember when I was uh, fifteen or this will be a quick sidetrack. When I was fifteen or sixteen, being out in town with one of my pals, and uh, you've met him, you know, Fojo. Uh, he, yeah. Uh, we were out and we were talking about how in the old Superman TV series, he would always take ages to like, like do the pose where he rips his shirt and shows the logo. And the point Fojo was trying to make was, you know, why can't he just like morph into his gear? You know, like surely that'd be more efficient yeah. for fighting the crime. You don't want to make a big song and dance about it. But the way it came out, he shouted in the middle of Buchanan Street as a 16 year old boy he went, why can't Superman just take off his clothes? <laughs> So you want to be Good careful. Point, though. I mean, no, it's true. I watched, but, you know. <laughs> I watched uh, the original Superman film last night, actually. It's funny how our, our brains are connected. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, I was in the school and the kids were wearing clothes. And uh, it was it was a non-uniform day and, and the teacher said, oh, by the way, it's it's a red non-uniform day. Everyone's still red. I was like, right, okay, cool. So the kids start coming in and they start sitting in their lines and stuff like that and ready to see the show. And this kid comes in and he's wearing a New Japan t-shirt. It's 10 ah. years old, right? New Japan t-shirt, and it says Los Ingobernables de Japón on the top, right? And because in New Japan, everybody's got a faction. It's either Bullet Club, or it's Chaos, or it's No Limit, or it's Ingobernables, and that sort of stuff, right? And then Jericho actually released his, a t-shirt that says Los Ingobernables de Jericho, because he wanted to take all the royalty money from the poor guy. Um, but, and I bought the t-shirt when I was in Florida. Um, what, from the so, Yeah. <laughs> no, from Hot Topic. Uh, so this kid is wearing this this in Gobble they have on t-shirt. And I walked over to him and I was like, oh, it's a New Japan top. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, who's your favorite wrestler? And if anyone was, you know, in these shows showed any significance to wrestling, I was always like over there asking who their favorite wrestler was. Because it's fascinating. It's like research. You know what I mean? Like what's, what's like the n- number one wrestler for young people these days? I don't know. I'm not a young person anymore, you know? So yeah. uh, I was asking, oh, who's your favorite wrestler? And he goes, oh, I don't know, WWE or New Japan? And I was like, oh, any. I said, obviously, WWE is probably bigger. And the guy, the wee guy's like, hmm, Tanahashi. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, really? I said, oh, Tanahashi's great. What about WWE? Uh, I don't really watch WWE. Nice. I went, what? I said, so hang on a second. So you only watch New Japan? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, sorry, you're 10 years old, a wrestling fan, and you only watch New Japan. I was like, how do you watch New Japan? And he was like, eh, New Japan World, obviously. <laughs> like, I was the, like, I was the idiot. Come on. Get with the program, Chris. Wake up and smell the coffee. And I was like, oh, <laughs> granddad. I was like, oh, yeah, I've, I've got a subscription too. <laughs> oh, man. Like, that reminds me. See, when I was in my first ever, like, teaching placement. So, like, for folks listening, when you want to become a teacher, the most common way of doing it is to, you go to university and you get qualified and you get placed in schools because there's no better place to learn than in, in a school. <laughs> like, so we, you know, like, so you, you, you go and you do the job, but you're kind of, you're shadowed by other, like, professionally qualified teachers. So I remember I was touring my new uh, placement school where I would go on to spend, like, eight weeks, you know, 
uh, and so I'm, I'm getting the tour, and it's a non-uniform day. Uh, and I walk past the, these girls, these like school-age girls, are walking past as in the corridor, me and this teacher. Uh, and one of the girls is wearing a Nia Jax t-shirt, and I interrupted my mentor to go, "Oh, <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not my, you're not like most girls." Oh and dear. God, and then she just went, oh my God, and just walked away mortified, like so disgusted. You know, that kind of teenage <laughs> disgust that you get at your parents yeah, 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 yeah. that age? Like she was so raging and her friends, like I'm now blushing thinking about it. <laughs> so, like, you know that like most girls? <laughs> this weird lanky guy who she's never seen before because I'm, I'm new to the school. Like I'm there on placement. Oh, yeah. you're not like most girls. That just sounds bad. <laughs> Oh, but it was the Nia oh, Jack yeah. t-shirt. Oh, so don't approach people like you know, like when they're wearing wrestling gear. That's what I've learned from this. Yeah. Although I did, I did walk through the city center once with my ICW beanie hat, and I walked past a guy with the same hat on, and we just had a wee moment of smiling, going "Eh," yeah, as we walked <laughs> past each other. You know what I mean? Do you remember uh, the O2 propaganda? R.I.P. One of the best yeah. nightclubs in Glasgow. Oh, uh, it felt fun. It was, right? It was always more like in a casual in there. And when one time we saw someone wearing a, a Bala Club t-shirt and he was with someone who was wearing a Bullet Club t-shirt. So it's almost as if like they showed up with the same outfit on, but it's just a different first word. <laughs> oh man, it's lovely. I love these interactions. Like I had another one. I remember being down in London when I was 21 uh, and this is in 2012. So the context is important here because of what was happening in wrestling in the summer of 2012. Uh, and I was at Abbey Road, you know, where the famous you yeah. know, the studios are and where the Beatles uh, Zebra Crossing is. So I'm literally at that Zebra Crossing, you know, from the Abbey Road album cover. Uh, and I'm wearing that same homemade Daniel Bryan t-shirt that he commented on when I met Daniel That's Bryan. Right. And I met you. Uh, and I walked past the guy with the iconic Best in the World t-shirt. And Punk and Brian were feuding at this time, and I just looked at him and I went, "No!" <laughs> like Daniel Bryan, <laughs> and uh, my ex was just like mortified. <laughs> that and, was that the day? Was that the day that she became your ex? <laughs> you know, I, I wish, but no. <laughs> um, there you go. Uh, but I love. It's funny that we've kind of gone on to a new topic now. You're talking about New Japan, but it's and doing uh, the school show. But um, it is nice when you're wearing wrestling gear and you walk past another wrestling fan, and yeah. it's like uh, you have that thing in common. Yeah, but that was it. Now it's just I was thinking about that story last night, and I was like, the, the wee guy was like, "You're an idiot." Of course, I'm, it's New Japan World. How else are you supposed to watch it, Dafty? So um, yeah, that's funny. Um, I would like to take a break if you don't mind, because I've drank a cup of tea and water. And uh, oh, yeah. then we'll come back, we'll play a wee game, and I'll tell you Ooh. a nice wee story. Toilet break. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so I thought we'd do a little, uh, we're having a wee sort of chilled episode this week, ladies and gents, I don't know if you can tell. And uh, I've got a wee thing that we can maybe think about for the next little bit. And um, I have a question for you to start things off and in terms of, I know you're like a like a big podcast fan and, and you know, you like things in terms of, you know, wrestling on YouTube and that sort of thing. Are you familiar at all with the very famous wrestling YouTube channel called OSW Review? I definitely know it because the minute you said that, I could envision the kind of logo. Uh, okay. I might have to look it up or maybe should I not for the purpose no, of No, don't. No, no, no. That's fine. That's good. That's good. That's good that uh, I know, you're I not too familiar with it. Okay, so it's this, if for those of you who don't know, OSW Review, Old School Wrestling Review, is uh, three Irish guys, uh, Jay, Steve, and Steve. And uh, they started off in 2014, maybe, maybe a bit earlier than that. Uh, and they, what they would do is they would work their way through the Hulkamania era uh, of, re- of wrestling, and they would just review every single pay per view and they'd break it down very, very like in detail. And uh, Jay, the person who would edit it all, just went all out in terms of editing. They put footage in, pictures, research things from Raw, things from the pay-per-views, things from TV shows. Like, it's just an expertly uh, created podcast. It's a sort of video podcast where you can kind of watch along, right? Yeah. So uh, they did the whole Hulkamania era. Then they did some ECW, some Attitude Era, some TNA. They've done a bit of everything. And now they're doing, like, um, new generation stuff, right? So mm-hmm. in 2017, I think, I just kind of discovered them. And I had, like, a whole summer of just watching all the reviews and stuff. I was doing it whilst I was playing the 2K video game. It was always, like, a fun routine I would have. And I got really, really into them. I thought they were hilarious, and uh, I've not watched them as much recently because um, I don't know why. It's just like I guess I haven't been as up for watching them, and because I guess I'm watching so much other stuff, it's kind of taking me away from it. But I always really enjoy the show. One of the things they do on the show is they create their own stable, their own factions, right? 
And right. uh, you know the term when, like, you see someone that maybe isn't as loved or isn't as respected or whatever, you call them, like, you go, oh, there's my boy. You know, like, yeah. oh, it's my boy, Glenn, or whatever, right? So what they do is they have boy stables. So they have, like, each, all three co-hosts, they all have their own faction of boys. And it's wrestlers that are not overly successful, not mm-hmm. overly popular, but you love them. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So since I kind of fell in love with that podcast, I started doing it with my pals, and I said, "Well, we should create stables of our favorite, you know, wrestlers that are a bit obscure and that sort of thing." And for ages now, we've been adding to our boy stables. We've been, um, we've been removing people who aren't worthy anymore. And there's certain criteria, you know, if you're like a multi-time world champion, you don't qualify. You have to be someone that's not booked very well, or that someone is a bit daft, um, someone that maybe deserves more but doesn't get the right booking. I always like to look at it like someone who's maybe not as very successful and is a bit daft, but is also a wee bit crap as well. Just someone that you love, you know, that you don't really know why you love them and have them in your group, your boy stable. He's my boy or female. So I thought I was going to ask you the question, do you have any like funny, obscure favorite wrestlers that you would add to a stable of wrestlers that you, if you were to defend these wrestlers and say, <laughs> I love these people because, is there anybody that jumps off the page? I mean... When I was like 9, 10, 11, I had a bit of an obsession with Scotty Too Hotty. That's a perfect example. Um, <laughs> so, you know, case in point, like I was so psyched. I couldn't wait for uh, SmackDown 2 Know Your Role on PlayStation 1 to come out. Like, because I'd, right. been, I'd been allowed to rent the first one a few times. Uh, and like back then, gaming magazines were good. Like they were all the rage. You know, it was pre like you know internet in every household. And you you would you I remember getting a magazine which had like a a, a review which anticipated the review of SmackDown two, and looking at all the screenshots. And one of them was a screenshot of the animation right. of Scotty Toy doing the worm. And I thought, oh my god, you can do the worm in this game because it wasn't in the first game. Um, uh, and so when I finally did get the game for Christmas. I went crazy and Scotty Totty held every title on my roster for this mad into. That's great. Um, but because like the, the the system like couldn't handle a, a character having multiple titles like the current games can do. So right. he would just like hold all the titles, but he would enter with just the WWF championship, the big blue attitude era one. Um, <laughs> Scotty Totty is the world champion. I love it. And I think it's just because like I was so this would have been like 2000 into 2001. So I was nine and 10, right? And I loved colorful, funny, eccentric, wacky wrestlers. That's why I loved the three faces of Foley because he mm. was such a wacky character, um, particularly Mankind and Dude Love and Commissioner Mick Foley. Um, and so for Scotty, you know, even though he was never a main eventer, uh, and, you know, at his best run, he was a successful tag team wrestler. To nine and 10 year old Glenn, he was as big as Steve Austin, The Rock. And that is not an exaggeration. I saw him in the yeah. same level as that. I would have been as starstruck by seeing him. And indeed, I was when he wrestled the Hurricane at Rebellion 2001. I was so, <laughs> so happy to see him. Were you like, at that show or something? I, th- I think it might have been there. You know, I can't really remember. Um, right. <laughs> I remember at Rebellion 2001 uh, during that match, uh, Robert saying to me, you know how Scotty always does the face, the bulldog thing, the, t- the double-handed bulldog before the win yeah. to set up? Yeah, yeah. Robert kind of mimicked that move with his hands and said, Glenn, Glenn, just so you know, as soon as he does that, it means he's going to do the worm. And I'm like, I know, I watched the show. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I guess for me, like, there's probably a few, but I love the wackiness. I love the dancing. I love the worm. Uh, he's probably the top of the list because he was my kind of obscure obsession as a child. And I still, every time he shows up for like a reunion show, I'm always delighted, you know? Yeah. Well, there's your homework for next week then. You can come up with your boy stable. Who's your boy mm. in the wrestling mm. Um so again, criteria can be just someone who's a bit daft, who's a bit not not any very you know very successful, very popular, but just someone that you've always really liked. I can give you my mm. ones, members of my Please stable. Please do. Please so do. probably the main the main man who would be world champion in my boy stable would be Maven. I love Maven. Oh, good choice. Um, I don't know why. I always loved them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, it's my heart it's edited out the the network 
I it's know. Not on the network, the song. It's oh, so it hurts sad. my heart. Um, so what good stable would you know involving Maven would it be without Raven? Uh, <laughs> so Maven and Raven. I always loved Raven. Um, yeah. I'm talking like 2001 Raven. Like ECW Raven's cool, but he's a bit too cool for the boy stable. It needs to be 2001 Raven. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Like and then another one, Moppy Raven. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Go go go. Another one would be, of course, we've mentioned him a lot on the show before, Rikishi. Yep. Oh, he's a big Rikishi fan, some, similar to Tuku and, and Scotty Toy. And then, of course, there's Taz. Love Taz. Uh, and um, my sort of substitute, if someone was injured, I would bring back Ty Dillinger, the perfect 10. Um, ah, okay. I love that character so much. Um, and I was I was not miffed by the fact that he wasn't used properly on the main roster. Uh, but just, I was kind of happy the fact that happened because he remained my boy. He didn't go overly popular. But in NXT, when he'd came out, and everybody knew he was going to lose. Everybody knew he was going to lose. But because of that, the full sale crowd fell in love with him because he was the guy that always came out, did a good job, and lost. So when he started yeah. to win, it was like amazing. Like, I don't know if you remember. I think it was the summer of 2016, I'm going to say. I think it was, yeah, it was 16 because it was the time it was uh, Balor and Joe in the main event of TakeOver in the cage match. It was the end when it was, the end is here. The <laughs> end is here. The opener of that show was the debut of Andrade. I love Andrade. And Andrade could be another good shout for for, um, oh, for yeah. the boys' stable. He's a bit too good, I think, but there you go. Um, the debut of Andrade and his first opponent was going to be Ty Dillinger. And uh, it was uh, that, that kind of time around NXT TV sort of time where Dillinger was losing to everybody and the fans were getting behind him. So the first entrance on that takeover was Dillinger, and he just got this huge pop, and he was more popular than Andrade, who had been built up for weeks because everybody knew he was going to lose. Everybody knew this was about Andrade, but it was just like, no, we love Ty. And ever since that moment, Ty became this big star in NXT. Now I'm I'm so happy he's doing well in AEW and stuff with Sean Spears. He's becoming you know the kind of face of Dark, which is cool. Um, but I'd love to see him. You know, he's with Tully Blanchard and stuff like that. I'd love to see him in a main sort of feud again on the main show because he was, if you did with Cody Rhodes a lot um, after he hit him over the head with that steel chair, great angle. They only had the one match. I was wanting a couple of matches, you know? So um, mm-hmm. they've got great chemistry because they've been pals for so long. So um, yeah, that, that, that'd be my boy stable right now. Maven, Raven, Rikishi, Taz, and the perfect like 10, Ty Dillinger. I mean, I would definitely, for mine, I would definitely, uh, I would add the headbangers. I love them, motion fracture. Oh, really? Do you know what? I'll tell you something. I love all wrestlers, right? The one act I never got into or liked at all was the headbangers. I don't know why. Dude, real men wear skirts, okay? Just <laughs> you, when you had to be in there. I love the... I think I put D'Lo Brown on there, I think. Good uh, shout. Great shout. Probably, this might sound weird, but I guess that's the point. Paul London. I was a big, big fan of Paul London. Perfect example um, as well. And, and got to be Taz, surely. Uh, yeah, Taz is there for sure. I wonder who else. Probably the Hurricane, the zombie from the first episode of ECW on Sci Fi. Oh, don't be daft. <laughs> nah, that's daft. <laughs> <laughs> that's too daft. Uh, but yeah, like. I, don't know, uh, I, don't I, like limit. I guess there's a limit. I guess you can only have like six, maybe at most. I don't know. Did I ever tell you that uh, when Paul London did a match in ICW, he jumped in the crowd and gave me a hug and then went back to the, the ring? <laughs> I think you did tell me that, but I, um, it's always nice to hear. Yeah. Another story for another time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, you can think about it if you want and come back next week with a with a full pack stable with a leader, a manager, a substitute, nah, I, a theme song I, if I you want. I don't want pack in it. He's too successful. He's a bit successful, yeah. I, I can't wait for him to come back in AEW. Yeah, like, man. He's. I still think the best of him is yet to come, honestly. I know you're kind of relatively new to watching AEW on a consistent basis, but did you see this Iron Man match with Kenny Omega on Dynamite? Nah, man. Missed that. Oh, mate. Oh, God. It was probably the best TV match I've seen in a long time. Maybe uh, Daniel Bryan and AJ had a good one recently on SmackDown. But um, but until then, anyway, it was the Dynamite right before Revolution back in February. First hold, it was like a half an hour, 30 minute Ironman match. Omega and Pac, so good. Um, So definitely, definitely worth checking out anyway. But um, yes, I guess we will close today's episode with an installment of Meet a Wrestler. Does that sound good? Mm, Sorry, I'm swallowing some wine uh meet wrestler yes please i I, I can't i can't be bothered telling a story so why don't we cue jingle and we'll hear one from you oh fine meet a wrestler we've met a wrestler in the flesh oh yeah 
Okay, so uh, this week's Meet a Wrestler, or this installment of Meet a Wrestler, uh, I, I noted down everybody that I've met and I'm thinking, okay, what are the best stories? What are the stories I'm going to get the most material out of? And uh, all the ones that are left on my list now were very, like, standard. You know what I mean? Like, we're not, it's not always going to be the Bucks or Shawn Michaels. I'm not going to knock anybody's hat off. You know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> always going to be a Jeff Hardy. Now, from now on, after this one, they're all going to be pretty standard. Like, I could just go up and meet them and have a good conversation or whatever, right? So, you, I'm going to have to rely on you for the wacky stories, if that's okay. Right, okay, okay. Well, we'll make some new memories so, in the future, I hope. I hope so. I think that'll be that be a lot of fun. And I, and I was we've said that before that we kind of go out of our way now to try and make yeah, memories sure. and stories that we can talk about. Um, so this this encounter happened in two thousand and eleven, okay. and around this sort of time, I was uh, really into my UK wrestling scene, especially obviously in this country. Um, traveling around to see Lionheart well, wrestle. Well, you do and, live in the uh, UK. I do live in the UK, yeah, but it's Scotland anyway. Yeah. I travel around a lot and. Uh, I'd go all over the country just to see the, the you know this roster, but mainly Lionheart and Wolfgang and, and the guys that I knew you know really well. They're the ones I wanted to see, and if I yeah. saw they were on the card, I'd be like, okay, we have to go, you know. And that's why I think you know the British wrestling scene doesn't get as much credit as it maybe deserves, because um, it was literally you know from nothing to what it is now, you know, and and now he's got a whole brand in NXT, you know. Um, yeah. so around this time, twenty ten was really the year that I kind of took off, but. This is 2011, and around this time, there was lots of different promotions. ICW was was still kind of growing its legs and getting into the kind of mainstream that it is now, you know. Um, but I'd actually argue that there was actually bigger companies, you know, than ICW. ICW just started running nightclubs at this time. Yeah. Um, so around the time, there was SWA, which was the Scottish Wrestling Alliance. That was the first one I went to in 2008. There was ICW, of course. There was PBW, which was Premier British Wrestling, which is, I loved PBW. That was oh, good there. Yeah. They used to run ads in Power Slam. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why I liked the logo. I just did. I liked the way it looked. Um, mm. And then the other one was BCW, which was British Championship Wrestling, and it was run out of Kilmarnock. I don't know why it was called British, and it was out of Kikili, but there you go. Um, <laughs> so that, they were always very special because they would, they would have the best production value at the time, BCW. They would have yeah. some pyro, and they would have a nice stage, nice fancy lights and stuff like that. And they'd have like a, like the entrance ramp sometimes would go right up onto the apron, a bit like Dynamite is now in the pandemic. Oh times. yeah, I love that. Um, I love that look. WCW used to do that back in the day. Yeah, they did, yeah. TNA did it for a bit and I guess they, they started breaking all the time so they went back to normal. But So I, I would always go to BCW every so often. Um, I'd go with my mate Evan or my dad and they were always the more expensive ones though. Sometimes they'd bring imports in, that sort of thing. And uh, I would always check Power Slam and, and Facebook and stuff like that to see if there was any shows coming up and a- any you know American talents coming in that I could maybe go and meet and go and see. And on this occasion, it was uh, advertised for May of 2011, and they were bringing in the one and only Big Daddy Cool, Kevin Nash. No. Was coming, was coming to BCW. Now, this is, this is Kevin Nash. This is not Diesel. This is not dyed hair, Kevin Nash. This is grey hair. Right, I have to make that clear. Grey hair, um, red singlet, Kevin Nash. Right. Yeah. So it was, it was like, okay, he's coming to BCW, come and meet Kevin Nash and stuff. And I was like, oh my god, that's such a big name, you know. And you, you'd assume that Kevin Nash was like expensive to bring in. You know what I mean? Like, just he has this kind of aura that he's always about money and that sort of thing. But then ICW yeah. brought him back in twenty seventeen yeah, or something. You know? Oh no, yeah, yeah, you're so, right. Yeah. It did. You know, it must not be that expensive. He must love doing it. You know, he wouldn't do it otherwise. You know. Um, yeah, do you remember that ICW show when he was the commissioner? And I just couldn't—I'd met him before, but I just couldn't believe how big he was. He was huge, was so yeah, tall. Like I I missed that fear and loathing, uh, unfortunately. Well, did but you really? I, oh, yeah. It's, it's one of the only ones I didn't go to. But even watching the on-demand service, which I was a subscriber to at the yeah. time, he still looks huge. Which is weird because their ring isn't much different in size to a WWE ring. It's like a twenty by yeah. twenty, but it was still. Like what? It's like he he does you know look huge, like he's a massive man, and I've never, I don't think I've even never seen him live. Do you know that? I don't think I've really ever in any capacity. No. Oh, did you did you see their WWE show in November of twenty eleven? No, but I know you were there, and I'm raging. Yeah, about it, and I wasn't. You know, it was it was Cena, Zack Ryder, and Kofi Kingston versus the Miz, Truth, and Kevin Nash. How about that for a six man tag? Mm mental mm. um so this was advertised for 2011 that kevin nash was coming to kilmarnock 
Yeah, that's all right then. That sounds good. So it went. That was fine. Um, the, the idea of the BCW show is that you'd see the show, the show would start, and it would do an, like an intermission in the middle. And the intermission, yeah. that's when you would go and meet Kevin Nash. You would go and take a picture at the ring, oh, just at the okay. apron of the oh, ring. Cool. And which always meant the intermission would go on far too long because everyone was trying to meet him, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think it was, I would say it was a ticket thing. You had to either buy the next level up to meet him or whatever, you know. So yeah. after you met him, then the second half would start, right? So um, I thought because I had bought a ticket to meet him, I thought they wouldn't be as busy as expected because I didn't think everybody would have a ticket. But it turns out loads of folk were there to see him, right? So yeah. we went to get a drink or whatever at intermission and we came back and the queue was so long. I was like, oh my God, like I wonder if we're going to even get a chance to meet him. So we sit, we stand in the queue and we, we keep going, we keep going. It would like, uh, you'd go to the barricade and then the security guard was there at the barricade and then whoever it was, you know, if it was your turn, they'd go, right, okay, on you go and you'd go past the barricade and you'd walk like down the entrance ramp. It's hard at an entrance mm-hmm. ramp, it was just a wee kind of lane, but it was cool because it was the entrance, the entrance ramp there anyway. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you'd walk to the entrance and then you'd just stand at the apron. This is before the apron was next to, the, the ramp was up against the apron, but it was on the floor. And uh, you just stood next to him and you took the picture and it was uh, David G. Wilson, the photographer. Oh um, yeah. So he he would take the professional picture and then he would say, okay, well, it's going to be on Facebook tomorrow. You can just get your picture there. I was like, okay, that sounds cool. So I'd taken the rise and fall of WCW DVD with me. I said, I'll get this signed by Kevin Nash. So awesome. we're standing and it was it's really cool. It's like this yellow case. I thought it would look really cool in black signature. And I was right. Yeah. Um, so I was standing there and I was holding the DVD and stuff and I go up to him and for, I'm a tall guy but this is, this is a long time ago now this is nine years ago so I was relatively yeah. shorter I was I was still tall but shorter than I am now anyway and I, it yeah. was one of the few times that I've been like OMG like, this guy's huge right Yeah. So, but, but you know at the time you're kind of starstruck and stuff you know you don't really think too much of it and it was really really quick these ones because it was just a picture and you kind of move on right mm. so I go up to him and I'm looking at him and he's not got a pen with him or anything and I was like, surely, surely he's signing autographs as well. And I'm looking about and I'm like, other people, I saw other people getting autographs and stuff. But it, because we were so far back in the queue, the intermission was over and we had to start the second half of the show. So basically yeah. what they said was, no more autographs. No more. Oh, man. Just a picture, right? So you know how, it, it was a bit like Daniel Bryan and Kane where they were like, no cameras. You're a bit raging, but you're okay, fine. But you're a bit raging anyway, right? Yeah. So I was like, what? So I'm just holding this DVD now. It's not as if I've got like my bag I can put it in. My bag's next to my seat and stuff, right? So yeah. it's not as if I can go out. So I'm just walking about with this DVD as if I bought it, right? So I walk up to him. I shake his hand. Hands are huge. He puts his hand on like the back of my neck and turns me around to face. Like he does it like with his hand, turns me around to face the right way with the camera. He's just so strong and like tall. And we take the picture, and he's kind of like, it's a good picture. I'm, I've got my long hair. I'm full-on teenager and stuff, and I look a bit flushed because I'm eating Kevin Ash. And I say, thanks very much for coming over. And he goes, you got it. And I said to him, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really that much. I'm quite shy, really, when it comes to, like, social interactions like that. But so I don't know what it is with these wrestlers. I guess I know it's, like, my one and only chance to say something to them, and I just get up the courage. I don't know. And I basically say, I said, like, can you sign this for me? And Kevin Ash says, oh, give me later. Give me later. I'll sign it later. Right? Mm-hmm. So... Now, now that I'm in my 20s, I'm thinking back to that time. And basically, that's him saying, nah. <laughs> yeah. nah, you missed your chance. Move along, kid, you know. But at the time, nine years ago, I was like, wait, I'm sorry, when's later? Wait, is that 10 minutes? Is that uh, an hour? Is that, is that t- when's later? Is that after the show or whatever? Um, so obviously, I didn't say that to him. I was like, all right, okay, no problem. I'll, I'll get you later then. And he was like, yeah, give me later, man. Give me later. So I said, all right, okay. So in my head, I'm meeting him. You know what I mean? Yeah. He said he said he said he's going to get it later, but now I'm thinking, yeah. what a ridiculous thing to think, right? <laughs> but at the time, naive wee boy Chris, I'm like, oh god, I, I need. He's going. To, he said he would do it. I mean, Kevin Nash is a man of his word. Absolutely. So we go back and we watch the rest of the show. Kevin Nash comes out on the show and stuff. Gets this big pop. It was really cool. Um, and uh, the main event was a, a tag match, a multi man tag match, a multi person tag match. Kaylee Ray was in the match. Actually, we love Kaylee Thanks. Ray on the show. Um, and uh, it was just cool. It was like the heel faction at the time. They were called the Aggression, and uh, they were against Kevin Nash and his partner, who I will not mention. Who were the, who were the ruthless? Kevin Nash went over, brother, and uh, Stevie Boy Xavier took the jackknife. And um, I remember watching it, and it was <laughs> this is daft. I'm saying this, but I couldn't believe how high up Stevie Boy was when he took that thing. Just the way like Kevin Nash would just let him go. It just looked brutal. Yeah. He just took this big power bomb. Kevin Nash won, and it was the old Diesel theme song that they played and stuff. It was just a cool moment. Yeah. So there we go. At the end, everyone starts piling out and stuff. And I'm sitting there going, what? 
hang on, I can't, I can't leave. I need to, I need to get my autograph. I, Kevin, I said, get me later. So I had, I had um, been to Kid Fight's training school, um, mm-hmm. and and I'd, I'd done some training with Which him. And I, all I, other story you should tell one day. I've been to Kid Fight's training school. Didn't work for me, so I went to Nikki Storms and Demos, and uh, I'll tell that story another day. Yeah. Um, good, good times. Um, Joe, Joe Coffey was raging because I could do a nip up and he couldn't. Anyway, uh, so so I was kind of pally with Kid Fight, not pally, but like I knew I'd spoken to him a bunch of times before, like informally, right? So, uh, Kid Fight was was recovering from his thing and he was he had just lost the match and stuff, and he was just walking about. Now this is like ten minutes after the crowd had left, and I walked up to Kid Fight and I was like, Ross, <laughs> can't believe I did this, <laughs> Ross. Uh, Kevin Nash said that I have to go and meet him after the show to get an autograph. Um, because I didn't have time for my autograph for the thing. I said, I paid for my ticket. I got my picture, but I didn't get the autograph. And Kid Faye was like, all right, you said I did, did he say that? And I was like, yeah, Kevin, Kevin Nash said I have to go get him after the show. And the way Kid Fight said, oh, did he really, did he say that? I'm starting to think, okay, now he's going to tell me to get lost. Mm. Kid Fight then said, all right, come on then. So Kid no. Fight takes me and my mate Evan backstage into the locker room to get an autograph from Kevin what? Nash. Right? So we walk in the locker room and Kevin Nash is sitting down now, right? And he's taking his boots off and his socks off and he's getting changed. And I'm just standing there. Right? Okay. So he's... <laughs> so he's just sitting there with his, with his gear off. He's got his singlet down. He's rolled up to like all the way up to his knees and stuff and he's got his hairs all greasy and that and he's kind of getting his, taking his elbow pads off and he's getting changed and there's just other wrestlers in there packing up their stuff. And there's me and Evan standing there with Kid Fight. And uh, Kid Fight's like, Kev, you're know the boys there. And Kevin and I, and now I'm thinking, what is happening here? <laughs> and I, I don't really know what I was thinking. And Kevin Ash was like, oh yeah, sure, come over. So I just walk over and I sit down next to Kevin Ash, who's getting changed, by the way. Did I mention that? Getting yeah. changed. <clears throat> Sitting down next to him. He takes my DVD and he puts on his mad sweaty leg, signs it, K Nash. Hands it back, and he's like, uh, "Did you get a picture or what?" And I was like, oh, yeah, "I got one, but I've not, I've not got it. I need to get it tomorrow." Because I was like, "The rule, you go on Facebook, you get a picture tomorrow." Yeah. And he goes, "We'll take another one just in case it gets, it gets. I don't want to swear. In case it gets up." That's what he said. So I've got this picture. I'm sitting in the in the locker room with Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash's hair is all greasy and fuzzy, like Kane and Roy Rumble 2001. <laughs> and uh, we're just looking at my phone and we're, we're smiling and that's the picture so I have two pictures of Kevin Nash one he's in his full gear looking brilliant and that was the professional one that David Wilson took and then I've got one post show of where he's singlet down his hair all greasy looking as if he's just been through a 30 minute match and there's me who had the gall to go up to a wrestler who'd just beaten who just got beaten by Kevin Nash brilliant and uh, got my autograph on my Rise and Fall of WCW DVD so there you go I, that I is amazing. Walked, walked backstage and met sweaty getting changed Kevin Nash. One of his lesser known gimmicks, but for sure. Dude, like <laughs> there's been so many occasions now in the 17 year or 17 week history <laughs> of this podcast where I'm kind of like almost a wee bit miffed because I've known you for eight years now. And I'm like, how have we known each other for eight years? Spoken about wrestling for years. Spoken about, uh, gone to shows together. Gone to Q&A events together. Spoken about Kevin Ash, I'm sure, in the past. And you never thought to tell me that you went backstage and interrupted him while he was getting dressed out of his sweaty clothes. No, 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 no. I never interrupted him. Kid Fight interrupted him. I just happened to be there for an autograph. No, sorry. Ross interrupted him. Ross! All right, Ross. Called him Ross. <laughs> uh, Ross, Kevin said he would sign my autograph. All right, come on then. <laughs> Maybe never to meet a wrestler with you again. Jesus, if they ever bring seen Punk over. Oh, listen, Hello. I would no. never. I, w- I would never do that now. There's no way I would do that now. I thought, oh, God. I guess because, like, because I've been in that position where, like, you don't want to disturb someone when they're in the zone. You know what I mean? Yeah. I guess I would just never do that now. If I saw Paul Heyman berating my pal about dropping stuff, like, I wouldn't go, oh, Paul, what is he like? You know what I mean? I'd probably say something about the weather. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you're just being nice now, but yeah, yeah. No, I'm serious. Like, I, I, I would kind of get kind of scared about that and just say it. But at the time, I was nervous as anything at the time. But like, just I don't know. I guess it's just because I was younger and I thought I was more innocent, you know. Um, Dude, and because I knew to... I, I, I spoke the kid fight before, you know. You need to promise me that the title of this episode will be something along the lines of <laughs> the time Chris interrupted Kevin Nash getting changed. Please, Dude, okay. that would, that, that's the draw. That's a draw. That is money. <laughs> that's the draw. Right, okay, deal. Well, um, you know, JBL yeah. at one night stand. You put my name on the marquee, it sells out. It's like that. That's the logic. Okay. Everybody listening is probably like that one night stand crowd and just chanting to me right now to shut the cup. No, they're going, you deserve it. <laughs> oh, but there you go. That, that's my last real wacky story, other than. A couple I can maybe think of that are a bit daft and maybe yeah. like oh, running after someone. I'd love to hear you at some point down the line tell your Lionheart story. I think that'd be a nice one to hear you talk about one day. That's what I was thinking about. That's that's like the next like really daft one. But in terms of nothing beats, you know, going into Kevin Ash's dressing room when he was all sweaty and getting changed. <laughs> that's amazing. I love learning stuff like this. Man, <laughs> this has been a good one. Uh, we definitely, you know, you saved our rock in Austin for the main event for sure here at WrestleMania oh, yeah. 17. And uh, <laughs> uh, well done. So that needs to be the title. The time <laughs> that Chris interrupted Kevin Nash getting changed. Something along those lines. You can maybe think about it. I'm going to go find the picture once we're done recording here and I'll, I'll send you the picture and I'll post it on I'm the lost. social medias this yeah. week. Please um, do. I have, yeah, I can't I have, wait to see it. I have the actual. Uh, oh, do you know what? Oh my god, I just I just remembered something as well. Okay, Good. so I got a whole part of the story wrong. This is uh, this won't go on any longer. But this is this is um, a complete wrong part of the story. Okay, it was the month after they brought over Magnus, who was the TNA World Champion at the time. That's um, right. Okay, and and his the rule with him was you got the picture taken at interval and the autograph at interval, and um, and then you got your picture on Facebook the next day. Oh my! Right. I can't believe I forgot about this. Oh, this is, I can't believe this. So, uh, the Kevin Nash one was, they would take the picture at the interval, and the reason it was at the interval is because they wanted to get the pictures developed in time for the end of the show, right? right. So you wouldn't get a digital copy. It was a physical copy, a picture, and, a, and like a wee sort of black card, right? So I also have the picture of me and Kevin Nash signed by Kevin Nash. And that's proof that I went into his locker room afterwards because the picture signed by him as well. That's right. I oh, that. brilliant. You need so to send actual, me... I want a picture of that picture and I want the phone picture that you took when he's all sweating. Yeah. That's what we need so, to send so he's signing... The, so I don't know how he agreed to take the picture in the backstage then because uh, he did say something about the picture being f***ed up. But like, he signed the picture there in the, in the dressing room and that. So I've got the picture of, of that and then I've got the, the backstage one as well. And I think they were just like shouting names like at the end of the show. They just be like, Moffat! And but that's me. And I think that's where Kid Fight was because he was helping hand out the pictures. And that's what I would have said to him. By the way, Kev said he would autograph my DVD for me. So that that makes more sense. It wasn't just it, I didn't just catch Kid Fight walking back to the stage. You know, he was actually handing out the pictures. So there you go. That's 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 that sign. So I'll go fish out right now and I'll send you a picture. Nice one. I, I can't wait to see it, dude. This has been a good one, hasn't it? I mean, I've enjoyed oh, it. Yes, you, we love it when it's nice and jovial like this. It's always nice to chat some wrestling in as wacky of a way as we can. But thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Glenn, for being my tag team partner once again. Seventeen Richard. episodes strong. Um, it's uh, it's it's being a blast every single week. And uh, yes, thank you very much, everybody, for downloading and streaming and listening. And uh, you can follow us on social media. It's Instagram is at Wrestle Connection. And Twitter is at WrestleConnect1. God, I would love those to be the same. And yes. uh, you can subscribe to <laughs> us on YouTube by searching the Wrestling Connection podcast for exclusive videos, uh, individual excerpts from the episodes and full episodes if you like to listen to your podcast on YouTube. And you can get me on YouTube, CM42TV, with new videos nearly every single day and uh, a new episode of the Wrestling Connection every single Sunday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks again, everybody. Glenn, would you like to sing us out this week? I will also just add, you can also get me on YouTube, but only if you're one of my pupils and you want to learn about poetry. But otherwise, <laughs> do I want to sing you out? Uh, the the answer to that would be, turn it up. Bang it up, bang it up, bang it up, bang it up. Woo! <laughs> That's what we call a medley. Uh, Is that a remix of it. Scotty Tim Hoy and Kevin Nash? <laughs> I thought it was appropriate. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Cheerio.